Dumelang Sanbanani Habari Yajioni, fellow Africans, good evening. We are coming to you live today from various parts of our continent to celebrate Africa Day, which was on the 25th of May on Monday. But what kind of Africa do we live in today? Is this the Africa that, is this the Africa that we envisage for ourselves? Who are we as Africans? Where did we come from? How did we get to be here today? How, do, how can we make people stay and live and thrive on this continent that we call home? We're going to learn how to embrace African heritage and learn about ourselves, who we are as African people, to use that to thrive on the global stage. The Mandela Institute for Development Studies, in partnership with the Center for African Philanthropy and Social Investment at the Wits Business School, together with the African Development Agency, NEPAD, have come together to put together a lineup of speakers for you to talk to African heritage and discuss how we can all be part of the change, embracing our African heritage to move this continent forward. We have an exciting lineup of speakers for you today. We have Dr. Ngosana Moyo, who is the founder of the Mandela Institute for Development Studies. We have Mayor Jennifer Chirige, who is from the African Union uh, Development Agency's NEPAD. We have Professor Kwa Pra, who is a professor of sociology from the University of the Western Cape. We also have Professor Adeke Adibayo, from University of Johannesburg, and he's the director for the Pan-African Institute for Pan-African Thought and Leadership. We also have Amanda Sevilla, a young African entrepreneur who is the founder of Haditi Africa. And we have Sir Michelle, who is a humanitarian and African stateswoman and the chairperson for the Mandela Institute for Development Studies. Just a few logistical issues before we begin. You are most welcome to post your comments um, on the live chat if you are joining us from YouTube today. For those of you who are joining us on Zoom, you can feel free to type your questions and comments during the webinar on the Zoom chat. At the end of the talks, we're going to open up for Q&A because we want to hear from you. So we encourage you to sit back, be present, open your minds and open your heart and let us engage and discuss Africanness. To open for us, I would like to invite uh, May Jennifer Chirige, who is from the African Union Development Agency. She's going to speak on, uh, on behalf of NEPAD and also share welcome and greetings to all of you. May Jennifer, you're welcome to speak. Thank you very much, uh, Kara. And um, I would like to greet the distinguished panelists and guests and everyone who is connected to this very important uh, webinar today. It's really a great honor and a privilege to participate in this webinar where we are gathered to embrace our Africanness and our African heritage. I bring greetings from the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD. The Africa we are talking about today, the Africa we want, is the Africa that was envisioned by Agenda 2063. Through Agenda 2063, AU member states have rededicated themselves to the enduring Pan-African vision of an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa, driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the international arena. Agenda 2063 is the continent's master plan for transforming Africa into the global powerhouse of the future. The aspirations reflect our desire for shared prosperity and well-being, for unity and integration, for a continent of free citizens where the full potential of women and youth, boys and girls, is realized. If I were to say, I bring you greetings from the future where the hopes and dreams of Africa's youth have come to pass, you may well ask, so what does 2063 look like? I have three um, thoughts that this inspires in me, looked at through the prism of a few of the areas of human endeavor that are captured in Agenda 2063. 
Firstly, let me address the issue of our heritage. In 2063, Africa is celebrating its heritage, its minerals, forests, oceans, human resources, its diverse culture, its history, its traditions, and rich languages. And this has helped us develop an awareness about ourselves. Our African heritage has fundamentally shaped our worldview and driven our development trajectory. In 2063, Africa's largest solar farm in the Sahara Desert is supplying clean energy to Africa and to Europe. Agriculture is booming. Africa is producing its own food, adding value to its natural resources, building world-class infrastructure, and the African continental free trade area has brought prosperity to the continent. We celebrate the arts and culture. We have world-class museums that are arenas for the display of African pride and that are an expression of African Renaissance. Secondly, I see a future where the demographic dividend has paid off. Statistics show that 70% of Africa's population is under 25. This is our greatest capital. In 2063, we have millions of skilled young professionals. They have figured out what to do with what we have, and they have taken charge of the development agenda. The youthful generation is in charge of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, drone technology, the internet of things, and so on. The amount of power this represents is significant. In our future, these tools used properly and responsibly have allowed connectivity of ideas in real time, ideas that have propelled the continent forward. My third point relates to acceleration of Africa's digital and technological transformation. In 2063, Africa has adapted and adopted. A quantum leap has been made in the capacity to use technology to innovate, create, and re-image solutions. The future has gone digital. For example, with over 1 billion SIM cards on the continent, mobile money has facilitated a boom in entrepreneurship. We have adapted to technology and we have kept up with globalization. In the 2063 version of Africa, the seven aspirations of Agenda 2063 have been achieved. Africa is prosperous, integrated and united. Governments are serving the interests of the people. The guns have gone silent. There are shared values of a common heritage. Women and youth are in the driving seat of development. And Africa is respected. As I conclude my remarks, allow me to commend the Mandela Institute for Development Studies for convening this webinar to shine a bright light on our Africanness. It is important that this new generation of Africans are given a reminder of the richness of our heritage. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mayor Jennifer. What a beautiful vision and a description of the future which we can manifest as Africans 2053 up to 2063. I'd like to call upon Mandela Institute for Development Studies to do an opening welcome and also through the African Heritage Program that we have outlined here today and in future events that we'll be holding. For this, I had Dr. Ngosana Moyo, who has not been able to join. So I will request Mama Grasa Mashal to do the opening and that outline of the African heritage. Mama Grasa Mashal is the chairperson of the Mandela Institute for Development Studies. Mama. Thank you very much, Kira. I'd like to welcome and thank everyone who has uh, made himself and herself available to join this webinar to which we attach a huge importance as uh, our contribution to celebrate the Africa Day. In fact, to celebrate Africa, we are every day. 
not only as an event. The Mandela Institute for Development Studies made a bold decision to focus on reclaiming and valuing our own way of being as Africans. Going back to say, who are we as Africans? What are the systems which we can identify as defining exactly who African way of being and doing things are? What makes us unique? and what make us distinctive. We believe it's very important to do this exercise to build our own identity, our own self-confidence, to affirm ourselves and to assert ourselves in the landscape of uh, nations. Every nation, and in this case, every continent has its own way of being. And we Africans, because of our history of colonialism, many times we tend to absorb and imitate systems which have been developed on the basis of other, other people's history and culture in detriment of our own history and our own cultures. We believe it's extremely important to reclaim that identity because it will give us the self-confidence in whatever are the options we make for our own development. Yes, we will inspire ourselves and we will learn from other cultures, but we need to be standing on the basis of our own being. We believe also this is important because the world is um, now much more connected because of the technology and particularly for our young people to offer them a platform in which they can interrogate, they can research, they can find out who we are, it is extremely important so that they don't become only global citizens without being genuinely African citizens first. It is not to ignore or to underestimate the contribution of the world, but it is precisely for us to be able to also identify what is it which we as African contribute to the world. It's not only the world to us, but us to the world. And I'm not talking about uh, material resources, but I'm talking about that uh, um, culture, our relationships among ourselves, within our communities, with our neighbors, with our, I mean, leaderships. It's how we relate to nature and how, what are the philosophies which make the way we are as Africans. So it's the soft way of being African I'm talking about. And that software, many times it's not, I mean, systematically put in a place we can identify it clearly. So minds would like to be, as I said, very bold and to bring together body or bodies of knowledge which we can refer to as exactly defining how unique, how distinctive, and what has been a long history, the contributions of Africans to the development of the human race today. I think I wouldn't be too long because uh, it's uh, I'm here more to listen and to learn much more than simply uh, to give inputs. But I really would like to say thank you, thank you to everyone who is listening and I'm looking forward to listen to contributions to be made this afternoon. Thank you.
Thank you, Mom, uh, for reminding us not to lose our essence and being on the global stage. We are going to unpack all of this and more during the uh, talks from the speakers. Remember, if you have any questions, comments, go ahead and type those on the chat. We are going to read all your questions during the open Q&A session. I'm going to open now to the speakers. Uh, I will invite Professor Kwesi Pra. He's an Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of the Western Cape, and he will tell us what Africanness means. What does it mean to be African anyway, Professor Pra? Thank you very much for asking me to join you this afternoon for this bit of um, exchange of ideas. Um, the, the term African and being African and Africanness is something which, or a term which is used sometimes a bit loosely and sometimes you suspect that there are as many understandings of the term as there are people using it. I mean that the differences in meaning sometimes abound. So what exactly do we mean by being African? What is Africanness? Now, if you look at the issue closely, you would find that there are basically two divergent understandings, two contrastive understanding of, of the term African, of the word African. One understanding, one line of understanding is based more on geography, uh, and sometimes biology, uh, and the other line of approach, the other line of the description of definition, tends to be cultural. Now, in other words, there are those who would suggest to you that an African is somebody from the African continent, full stop. Somebody born on the African continent, full stop. And sometimes they would add also that it's a black person. And a black person. The definition of African is almost equals to blackness. Now, these, this type of definition of an African is blackness is a biological feature. It is an immutable biological feature which you have. You were born with it and it's given. Geography is also something which largely precedes you. You are born in a certain country in the world, and it happens to be on a continent, and it's an, the African continent. Now, if we say that it is either one of these two, that it is just blackness and being born on the African continent, that stands in sharp contrast to the other set of approaches which point in the direction of culture. That is both material and immaterial culture. That is the language we use, the religious practices we have, the rituals we have, the customs we have, the beliefs, the ideas, the sentiments we hold, the values, the cultural values we have, which are also historically traceable. Now, human beings are largely, in fact, and 
this is not with respect to Africans alone, but the human community as a whole is defined largely on the basis of our cultures. Because if you were talking about color, for example, Jews in Israel today range from black to blonde. Arabs range from black to blonde. In fact, in the country where uh, Francis Deng is from, it is not possible to tell the difference between an African and an Arab by, by color. Because often they are, all of them are black. So the, the color, the biological definition of an African is faulty, it's flawed. 25 years ago, I wrote a book uh, which is called Beyond the Color Line where I made that point that the, it has no scientific basis. People are not essentially biological. People are essentially cultural animals. Human beings are cultural animals. In other words, as I said some time ago, if you take a Chinese kid, a kid who was born in China, and you bring him into Africa when he's an infant, and train him in Africa, you culturally form him in Africa, you would, at the end of the day, have an African child who does not look like the rest of the people around him, but who would, in every aspect of behavior and attitude and beliefs, and likes and dislikes be like all the other African kids around him. The same way, if you take an African kid, an infant, and you take him to China, rural China, or rural India, and you bring him or her up, in the end, you would have somebody who believes everything which other people in his environment, social environment, believe. So the cultural factor of an African, because it's also important for us to know that it is through the cultural equipments that we have, that we are able to transform societies, that we're able to do something with our society. It is through languages that we transact all our learning processes. Therefore, Africanness must be anchored on our cultural characteristics. Cultural characteristics, the characteristics of language, of customs, like what we were talking about before, gachacha, the traditions, you know, these are all cultural equipments, but nothing to do with color. And it is from there that we can build something up. Furthermore. Three more minutes, Prof. Oh, just three minutes left. Yes. Oh. Now, the other thing is that the Holy Grail, the summum bonum, the highest good of what we want in Africa, the instrumentation we need to be able to move forward is unity. Nyerere made a very important point 18 months before he died. He says, without unity, there is no future for us. And Krumah made that point already in 1963, as far back as that. And no other African, no African leader has brushed aside the idea of unity. All of them have sworn on, on the altar of unity. So unity is, is, is really crucial for us to be able, but above that, the cultural element to make that work, 
the cultural element, the language question, the need for us to educate our kids and build our future on the basis of our languages. This is important. This is my message. This is the message which I've been pushing for the past three decades, three more than decades. That the language question, that is what will liberate us. The moment we start putting all our knowledge in our own languages and adding on to that the scientific knowledge of the 21st century in our languages, we will liberate. The confidence will come back. The recognition and the self-respect will come back to us. I will stop you for the moment because I think my time has run up. <laughs> Just in time. Thank you very much, Prof, for reminding us that it's not about the color, but more about your culture and the languages that we speak, which defines the fabric of what being African means. Remember, if you have questions and comments for Prof Professor Prof, go ahead and type the chat. I can see your messages coming through. We will attend to all of them during the open Q&A. Our next speaker is Prof Adege Adebayo from the University of Johannesburg. He is the director for the Institute of Pan-African Thought. Uh, Professor Adebayo, keep your questions and comments coming through. We are very encouraged and excited to see them. I will read all of them towards the end. Are you ready, Prof Adebayo? Yes. Yes, we hear you. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Professor Pra and I have agreed that he'll be more conceptual and I'll be more empirical. And I also want to be an Afro-realist so that we confront the challenges as well. Seek ye first the political kingdom and all other things will be added onto it. This famous biblical injunction by Kwame Nkrumah still reverberates across the continent and its diaspora six decades after they were spoken. Um, this griot's tale that I want to tell is going to look at Africa's quest for three magic kingdoms of security, hegemony, and unity. Slavery, of course, was the original sin of Europe against Africa. Uh, European imperial locusts basically spread plague and pestilence across the continent and ravaged it over four and a half centuries. 12 to 15 million Africans, some of the most productive people, were shipped across the Atlantic to the Americas uh, in this sordid trade. And slavery basically provided the justification and the methods for colonial rule because this had been perfected in the Caribbean and Americas and then applied to Africa for a century. So Africa thus suffers from a curse that was invoked in Berlin at the Congress of Berlin, the notorious conference in 1884 to 85. German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck was the sorcerer who along with his apprentices basically used the wizardry of the Industrial Revolution's technology to divide and partition Africa. And the consequences were quite enormous. You had dependent, unviable economies, you had imported political systems, and you also had weak and balkanized states with 16 of those states landlocked. To further compound the treachery, the traveling Cold War circus arrived in Africa around 1960. And the superpower clowns and the pyromaniac French gendarme also fueled conflicts by basically putting billions of dollars in arms on the continent and also intervening directly in some cases. So in order to lift the geopolitical sorcery of Bismarck, Africa has been forced to embark on these three kingdoms. And I start with the security kingdom. Uh, since 1960, nearly 50 wars have killed over 11 million Africans. Today, 16.5 million Africans are internally displaced and 6.5 million Africans are refugees. The OAU tried its best 
to seek Pax Africana by deploying troops in Burundi, Comoros, and Rwanda in the 1990s, but they lacked the finance and logistics to be able to actually impose peace. The African Union that was born in 2002 in South Africa still continues to behave like an experimental guinea pig, not learning those lessons and basically deploying troops in Burundi, in Darfur, and now in Somalia without the wherewithal to be able to get the job done. What I think is important is to embark on a historical voyage now across the continent from the Cape to Cairo to examine the security challenges. In Southern Africa, where we start, South Africa during apartheid destabilized its neighbors, causing uh, a million deaths and $60 billion in damages in the 1980s. Thabo Mbeki acted as a Pied Piper of Pretoria, calling the diplomatic tunes to which warlords, rebels, and politicians danced, deploying 3,000 troops to Burundi and the DRC. And in the course of a short decade and a half, South Africa went from being the most destabilizing power in Africa to being its most energetic peacemaker, also contributing to peace efforts in Zimbabwe, Lesotho, and Madagascar. Uh, but the situation we have in northern Mozambique now, where Islamic militants in a gas-rich area were able to take over temporarily three districts, shows the fragility of African states. In West Africa, ECOWAS has gone the furthest in terms of efforts to establish a security mechanism, intervening in Liberia, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, Sierra Leone, and Côte d'Ivoire, even though the UN had to come in in many of these cases. Nigeria contributed 80% of the troops and 90% of the funding for the missions in Liberia and Sierra Leone. But today, we're not sure whether Nigeria will be a force for stability or instability, given the menace of the Fulani herdsmen and the fact that Boko Haram and Islamic State West Africa province have basically displaced internally 2 million people and led to 50,000 deaths. In neighboring um, France has also continued to pursue its neo-colonial policies, deploying 5,100 troops to the Sahel, which is a hotbed for Islamic militants. Most of the cannon fodder, though, the people that have died, have been soldiers from Mali, from Niger, from Chad, even as Burkina Faso has faced 800,000 internally displaced. And... Um, the, these problems have basically made this particular sub-region, West Africa stretching to the Sahel, also incredibly insecure. The Great Lakes of Africa, as many of you who have visited will know, is one of the most spectacularly beautiful parts of Africa. Rolling hills, um, dense forests, rising mountains, but the Great Lakes have been infected with ethnic crocodiles of the genocidal species. We've seen in Burundi and Rwanda the bloody cycles of conflict. In the Congo, you've had seven foreign armies, dozens of mercenaries and militias in a country the size of Western Europe that was basically uh, destroyed by Mobutu's Western-backed 31-year autocracy. So the UN with 20,000 troops have mostly watched the slaughter as over 3 million people have perished and 6 million internally displaced. Central African Republic also racked by conflict with militias, Christian and Muslims, uh, roaming around and 1.2 million displaced. And even in Cameroon, that was previously stable, um, you also have 325,000 dis displaced. East Africa on the Horn of Africa has also been quite divided. Ethiopia and Eritrea, you'll remember, fought a bloody border conflict in the late 90s. Ethiopia and Somalia had earlier fought the Ogaden conflict in the 70s with residual animosity still present. Um, and you've also have in South Sudan, for example, within two years of independence in 2011, an ethnic fueled civil war that has led to over 400,000 deaths 
and 2.5 million refugees spilling across the border. 1.4 million people are displaced in Ethiopia, and Somalia has not had a central government that's effective for three decades. On top of all of this, the US has also deployed 2,000 troops to Djibouti and is intervening in Somalia. The last African sub-region, of course, is the Maghreb. And the Maghreb region is often compared to a bird with Mauritania, Algeria, and Tunisia, the body, and Libya and Morocco, the wings. But it's been so incapacitated by conflict, it hasn't really been able to take off. So Morocco and um, Algeria have fought over the Western Sahara. And Algeria, which should be the hegemon, has also suffered a civil war. And the final event in this sub-region in North Africa is, of course, the Afro-Arab Spring, where long-ruling mummified pharaohs were toppled by technology-wielding youths in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya. But only in Tunisia have we had a fragile system. The second quest for hegemony has seen South Africa and Nigeria, particularly under Mbeki and Obasanjo from the 1999, to seeking to use hegemony to basically increase Africa's leverage in global politics. But Africa hasn't been able to use the presence of China as the largest investor on the continent to increase its leverage in dealing with countries like France and the US, which still have large military presence in Africa. The final quest has been a quest for unity and in involves six historical figures as well as the AU and, EU, uh, AU and EU. But unfortunately, a lack of capacity and cooperation has frustrated Africa's attempts to use its diaspora and also the Afro-Asian coalition from the Bandung Conference of 55 to increase its leverage. We start with Mandela, one of the greatest moral figures of the 20th century, but unfortunately, linking his name in 2002 with that of Cecil Rhodes, the greatest imperialist of the previous century. And we wonder why this monstrosity, because in effect, uh, we may have rehabilitated uh, a historical figure that's evil and should really have been left to the pit latrine of history. We also look at Mandela's successor, Mbeki, and Mbeki Mbeki and Nkrumah, of course, were Pan-African visionaries, Renaissance men, but they had different methods. Where Nkrumah wanted a federalist United States of Africa, Mbeki effectively had a more gradualist approach. And where Nkrumah drifted into autocracy, Mbeki remained a constitutional monarch. The European Union is often described as riding a bicycle. You have to keep pedaling in order to maintain the momentum for integration. The AU has been the opposite. Integration in Africa has almost been like the ride on the back of a rickety mammy wagon with failing brakes and lights and the memorable sign, no condition is permanent, inscribed on the vehicle. We then move on to Barack Obama, who when he was elected in 2008 as the first black president of the US, there was great expectations in Africa and its diaspora. Eight years later, his engagement with Africa was basically empty symbolism and basically continued the militarization of the Bush years. And Gandhi is the final figure. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi lived in South Africa for 21 years perfected the Satyagraha soul force methods of passive resistance. And his legacy more recently has basically been re-examined based on his racism towards black people in South Africa. But he nevertheless set off the chain reaction that was to lead to the liberation of Africa and Asia. And it was the torch of liberation that Gandhi handed to Martin Luther King that made Obama possible. So Satyagraha was born in Africa, exported to Asia, and used to destroy European imperialism. Through Gandhi's inspiration, Africa and Asia changed the world. Let me conclude. Yeah, two that's minutes. enough time. 
Let me conclude this journey that has stretched from the Cape to Casablanca by returning to Berlin where we started. I have a simple proposition. Africa needs to organize a new Berlin conference on its own territory. Um, we need to reimagine political systems and territories and federations that will effectively promote economic development and integration. So my final proposition, African states must basically, along with civil society, proceed to the ancient empire of Ethiopia, the seat of African diplomacy, to reverse the act of cartographic mischief that European statesmen imposed in Berlin 135 years ago. The ancestors of Africa must be invited to this grand diplomatic banquet where Kwame Nkrumah should hand over the torch of Pan-Africanism to Thabo Mbeki so that the curse of Berlin over Africa can finally be lifted. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Prof. Adipai. A very intriguing talk. Um, I've actually been reading about the Berlin Conference myself. So what do you all think of that? Let's have another Berlin Conference, but here in Africa, to undo the mischief um, that happened in 1884 and, that, and remove that legacy that we still live with today. So very intriguing. Please share your comments uh, and your questions. We are able to see all of them and we will read them during the open Q&A. We'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, our continent is described to be very youthful with a large population of youth compared to other continents. So to take any of these suggestions that we're discussing here forward, we need Africa's youth to be involved and we need to hear and speak to the African youth. So our next speaker is representing the youth. I invite Amanda Sevilla. She's the founder of Hadithi Africa and she will speak specifically to the youth from the youth. Amanda. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, to speak amongst great minds. I think me being here says that I'm also a great mind in the making. <laughs> um, so I would like to really um, start, start this off by thanking everyone for, for all the input as well on Africanness and what Africanness is. And I have a lot to say about this um, because I think my, my work in Hadithi Africa as well is really based on the African heritage and bringing it back and really reigniting what Africanness means to young people and how young people can really take Africanness and move Africa forward. And African development looks very different to very different Africans. And I, I, I hosted a, a, a talk with a number of young people on, on Africa Day to hear what they think African, African development looks like. But before I, before I go there, I, I'd really want to share little, just two seconds um, of my story in terms of why I started Hadithi Africa because I think it really aligns to how Africans can or how young Africans can really create the Africa that they want. And the basis of, or rather the history and the basis of Hadithi really stems in, in the African heritage and how I see it being lost in generations to come. And I integrate or rather I, I really communicate with a lot of young people who are even younger than me to find out what kind of heritage they are in touch with or what they know, what they don't know, what they want to know. And I realized that it has gotten so lost that if you ask the 12 year old today on what they think heritage is and what they think um, Africanist is, the only reference they have is heritage they celebrate in South Africa in September. And there is very little knowledge before and there is very little known about it and very little um, kind of taken through. So that's one thing that I, I really am passionate about in trying to move forward the African heritage. So people younger than me, my offspring as well, would be able to embrace that African heritage. And I think it really stems in, in, in the fact that our ancestors have um, failed to almost give us or pass on that African heritage just as much as we have failed to retrieve it from them. So it is a two-way street that I think has lost its connection in between somehow. So I think my, my work in Hadithi is really to 
almost bridge the gap between our ancestors and the future generation or the generation of today in order to bridge that gap so that when the older generation is unable to almost pass on that heritage that we become that bridge between um, them too so that young, younger generations to come and my generation today would be able to retrieve that heritage and also be able to um, pass it on to their offspring and their future generation as well but when it comes to as creating the Africa that they want. There's actually a case study that I'd want us to look at today. And that is of a, of a young fashion designer called La Duma, who, who owns the brand um, Matosa. And uh, uh, last year or two years ago, he, he has a very, very strong brand that is based on the Tosa um, culture. And everything that he does has that print, the pattern, everything is in there. So the one thing that happened is that um, Zara, a very, very well-known um, retail store, had released a sock, a sock um, collection that had almost identical pattern to the Matosa brand. And for him, creating that brand, he created it when he was doing his third year at the Nelson Mandela University. And for him, he created it trying to embrace firstly and trying to almost conserve the, her the Tosa heritage in clothes. And it's something that everyone wears. And it's so, it's obvious when you see it that this is the, the closer heritage. So for him um, to now find, find him in a place where a global retail store is almost mimicking exactly what he had done, he fought back. And for young people, I think one thing that we are is that we can be timid at some point, but he was not timid and fought, fought for his brand and saying that he wanted to take legal action to almost fight such a big and global brand just to almost fight for that heritage. And for me, it really, the, the genesis of it all is finding that love for your heritage. If you do not love something, you will not fight for it. And if you love for it, you will fight for it tooth and nail. It will not matter how much it costs for you to do it and how much energy it would take for you to fight for something. But it, I think it really, it really boils down to loving something so much that you will fight for it so much. So like what happened in social, like it was such a social media thing that it didn't matter which cultural background you were from, but you would almost support Matlosa in every single thing that he was doing in terms of taking legal action against Zara. And it, it was so important, I think, for young people to see that and to witness such a, such a fight that happened but all of it wasn't necessarily just to save a brand. It was honestly a fight for heritage. And as much as so much history has been erased and so much history has almost been forgotten, African history, I think it was important that um, um, a lot of history and a lot of heritage that has been lost or under, but that happened because it tells me that it is possible to fight for my heritage. It is possible for me to take my heritage and build a lucrative business out of it. Like I think a lot of people think, a lot of young people also think that the minute you take heritage as the core of your business, it will not succeed. And there are many case studies or many businesses out there who have kind of taken their business model and based it on culture, based it on heritage, based it on their tradition and are lucrative businesses today. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in having to debunk the thought that culture is, a, is an olden thing and heritage is an olden thing that we do not need to embrace, that embracing it is almost useless, that embracing it is not something that we need to do because it is an olden way of doing things and we don't need it today because it is not modern enough. And it is, I think it is our responsibility almost as young people to make culture as modern or not necessarily as modern, but taking it for ourselves so we can wear it, so we can wear it pr proudly and not just for one day and just for Africa Day and neither just for Heritage Day because like, like it, it's, a, it's an everyday thing. I think it is an everyday fight for us to fight for the heritage that we love. But that love just doesn't come from every, anyway. It's a love that needs to almost be built within children that are a year old, growing up, need to almost be exposed to it so vividly that it is obvious that this is something that you need to love. Not that it's something that you need to just push on the side and not care about or just 
something that you embrace on one day within the whole year, but it needs to be almost repainted. But the repainting of African heritage, I think, really lies on young people because we have a lot to lose. We actually, when it comes to African development, we have a lot to lose because if we do not take a, a pull up ourselves to almost build the Africa that we want, we're going to be the ones who lose at the end of the day. 20 years from now, 40 years from now, I'll still be, be alive, but I'll be in, alive in the Africa that I had built today, then. So if we almost take up uh, our arms and, and unify as a young people, but not only just young people, but unify as a continent, I think there's a lot that can be done to create that Africa that we want, because it is for us that we're building it. We're not building it. I think it's one thing that we need to almost remove from our minds that we're building this for someone else, that we're building this for someone else to enjoy or we're doing it for whoever. But we need to almost find ourselves in a position where as we see that we are doing this for me. And if, if, you, if we have that sense of thought that we are doing this for ourselves. There's a lot more that we can do, especially in every single industry. Now, to go to the conversation that I had with um, some of the young people that I was speaking to on, on Africa Day, each and every one of them was from a different industry. And they had almost the same thing to say from each and every industry, that if we don't unify, and I think that's really one, one a golden thread throughout this conversation, that if we do not unify, the future looks pretty dim. And if we do not unify, firstly, as an African people, and firstly, and secondly, also as young people, if we don't unite at all, then there, there is very little that we're working with. And there's very little foundation that we're build, building for ourselves. But there is a lot of thoughts um, that two I Two minutes, think, Amanda. Okay, there are a lot of thoughts that I think we need to almost remove from our minds as well. And first, that, that is going to come from almost removing the Western lens from our eyes and seeing Africa for who it is, for what it is, it's, it's beauty, it's, it's future, and every single thing that we see of Africa needs not to be what we've been forced to see, but what we almost want to see from it, from how we want to create that Africa. That was 63, but even beyond that, it is really up to us to take up arms and create the Africa that we want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. We're calling for you for our heritage, because if we love and care about it, we can defend it and we can fight for it. So there you have it. Every see your questions coming through. I just want to implore you please do not write a thesis um, just keep it and go ahead and ask your question I'll read the first few um, so the first one is for you Professor Pra what advice could you give to African people to avoid the victimhood status the need to blame others for our problems and our state of hopelessness Professor Adebayo, I'm hoping you can help with this one. How can Africa be better prepared to handle crises such as the COVID-19 without waiting for external remedies? Those questions are from Peace. We have another one from uh, Sehwai. Uh, Amanda, this one is for you. What are the biggest risks posed by COVID-19 African youth futures given the glaring good governance deficits in Africa? So given our bad governance, um, what are the risks for African youth? And then the last one, which any of you can take, COVID-19 is a big catalyst towards governance in Africa. How does the COVID-19 crisis provide an uh, opportunity for transformation in Africa? So let's take those four. Please keep your questions coming in, but keep them brief and to the point. So Fred? Thank you. Um, typical features of powerlessness, of a sense of inferiority, of inadequacy, of an inability to be able to, to, 
to meet the challenges of the world as we see them. I think it all comes, again, for me, it comes down to questions of uh, confidence and the confidence which can be only restored through a, se a sense of cultural empowerment. The feeling that we can, on the basis of what we are, what we have, what we have as heritage, we can stand up to all others in the world on the basis of equality. Now, again there, I'll go back to this language issue. Unless we start working with our languages, unless we can make a connection through our languages into our cultures, into our memories, and have confidence in ourselves as Africans and our belongings, we don't have very much of a chance. If you have a situation in which a child takes on European names, goes to a church where all the angels and the people close to God, quote unquote, are European types, if you grow up as a child like that, just imagine an African child growing up and going to church every Sunday, seeing all the images which are not like him or her. What do you think will happen? The kid will grow up feeling unhappy with how he or she looks like and will imitate try to copy the lifestyle and the physical representation of what he thinks is superior. So I think this question of victory mood comes also closely with the problem of, land, of culture. And the problem of culture rests squarely on language. The moment we start using our languages, like all other people who develop do, like the yeah, Japanese, the Koreans, the French, the Germans, the English. Everybody uses his or her language. We are the only people who do not use our languages. This, I think, is the heart of the matter. Mm. Thank you, Professor Pra, which is why we should get rid of our English names, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, Professor Adebayo, your question was, um, how can Africa be better prepared to handle crises such as the one that we have now without waiting for external remedies? You spoke about how we inherited our political system, inherited our laws, inherited everything that's here. So how can we respond to things without depending on the, uh, on the people that we inherited our systems for? Thank you. I mean, I think you, sh you should talk to health experts to be able to answer questions on COVID-19 because they have far more knowledge. But what I will say is that um, we've allowed health systems across the continent to be neglected and we're the least prepared continent, arguably, to be able to cope with the COVID-19 system. And I think the fact, as many have pointed out, that many of our leaders seek treatment abroad rather than actually improving hospitals at home is an indictment. And, um, you know, the growing indebtedness of Africa also. Many African countries are among the most indebted on the continent. And the fact that many of the conflicts in Africa you know, 10 of the UN missions are deployed in Africa and 85% of the UN's peacekeepers are deployed in Africa. That will also exacerbate some of these issues relating to how we deal with the COVID crisis. But I think this presents an opportunity for us to improve social sectors that have long been neglected and then to try to create viable national and sub-regional institutions and also work with UN agencies like the World Health Organization. Thank you. All right, um, for those of you who are on Zoom, 
you can raise your hand. So use the function to raise your hand. If you want to verbally air your question, you are welcome to do that. Raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you to speak. We have a few more questions. This one is from Charles. It's a bit of a thesis, but I'll try to summarize. Most, if not all, our laws are based on colonial legacy. As African people, we have our own laws and customs to foster harmony and justice in society. Nations such as Rwanda have the courage to apply um, law in an African way, the Gachacha courts, especially where the legal system does not serve the best interest of society. He's asking, why don't we proactively pursue a project of embedding our own cultures of Ubuntu into our laws and our way of being politically, economically, and beyond the social? So that is Charles' question. Any of you can take that. The next question is from, um, the comment rather, for Professor Prad is saying amen and thank you to that. The next one is to Jennifer from Ronald Zendia. Jennifer, the Agenda 2063 is a great vision indeed, but I think capacity remains the critical missing link. What are the capacity requirements for the attainment of Agenda 2063 goals? That is Ronald. The next question is from Tisangalalo uh, to Professor Pra. I am impressed with the title of your book that you wrote, Beyond the Color Line. Is your book on Amazon? Um, he's asking if he can buy your book on Amazon. He's watching from Ghana and he's a mind scholar. And then the last question that we can take now to Prof Adegeye. AU's commission to silence guns by 2020 is ambitious, but with the rising Islamist insurgency in countries like Mozambique and Burkina Faso, among others, is this achievable? Okay, so maybe let's take the first one, the long one about um, African justice laws and customs. Um, if we can find a way to put our own customs in the political and economic system? Yes. Um, I think this, this and um, other issues of rehabilitating or reconstituting our traditional systems and utilizing them for contemporary purposes is something which goes right across the board in all areas, not just with law, it's also in all other areas of our social lives. It's important for us to be able to build on what we have from the past, not carry it wholesale. Take, look at it critically, take what we can't use for the modern period and use what we can but remember that it is only by using what we have which is old which is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old that we will have any continuity and a sure-footedness in our way forward so in other words we should we should start from our cultural base we can change things but we must start from our culture. We not start from outside with other people's traditions and try to add our cultural base on that. Rather, we should start from our cultural base and add onto that whatever new inputs we want to be. But the foundations in all our areas of social life should be based on what we have, what we have inherited. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pra. Whilst you're still there, uh, about your book, is it available on Amazon? Yes, I think it is available on Amazon. It's, it's beyond the color line. It's come out in different editions. It's in French. It's in, it's in English. Uh, so very soon it will be in Chinese too. So um, <laughs> uh, 
available. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Prof. Um, Jennifer, your question was the Agenda 2063 is a great vision, uh, but what are the capacity requirements to attain it? Well, thank you for that very important question. Um, I think the frameworks are in place, the policy frameworks, everybody knows what uh, those are. What's required is for member states to take ownership of Africa's agenda. I think we need less reliance on uh, donor funding. Uh, member states have to make much more of a contribution to the, the African Union, for example, and this is already being done. And I think uh, we also need to see regional integration deepening and really uh, working so that we have more trade amongst and between uh, countries on the continent. And um, if African countries look inward and build uh, themselves up and have stronger regional blocks, I think this will be the foundation for Agenda 2063 really becoming uh, successful. And I think also roping in the private sector, which for a long time, uh, I think, in my view, has abrogated um, its responsibility towards uh, development. So I think working with the private sector, uh, the public sector, we saw this when um, the Ebola crisis uh, happened, the private sector stepped up and um, through the AU mobilization, we had a really excellent um, contribution from the private sector where they funded the health workers and so on. And I think the same is happening with the, the COVID-19 where we see uh, the, the African Union working hand in hand uh, with the, the organs of the AU as well as the private sector to ensure that um, there is adequate pharmaceutical products, adequate protection for health workers and generally assistance towards building up the uh, health service sector of our member states, which really need boosting, as has already been said by the other panelists. Thank you, Jennifer. Prof Adebayo, uh, the question about the agenda, sorry, 2020 being too ambitious to silence the guns with what's happening in Mozambique and Burkina Faso. Do you think it's achievable to silence the guns? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the guns will definitely, unfortunately, not fall silent in 2020 because I think that there are too many conflicts on the continent like Central African Republic, the DRC, Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, Northwest, Northeast Nigeria rather, that are still going to continue because until we tackle the underlying root causes of these conflicts, which lie in governance difficulties and often discrimination in terms of how you know public goods are delivered you're not really going to have stability in these countries but there is hope though and there are some signs at least that some of the conflicts are being resolved south sudan for example it's very encouraging that we have a transitional government there since february and even though there's still conflict in Jungle and some of the areas, the situation is much better now than it was before. Rwanda and Uganda's rapprochement also, if it continues, will help with resolving some of the issues in the Great Lakes. And there are long running conflicts like Liberia and Sierra Leone, which have also been calmed. I just want to make, if I may, a very quick comment on Rwanda and I don't know that much about the Gachacha courts and we must recognize the difficult history from which Rwanda is coming but one of the points I want to emphasize a political system in which you have a president that routinely gets 95 percent of the votes in which the media is not free in which there's human rights repression is not really going to be and cannot serve as a model for the continent. So it's important that a lot of the talk about Rwanda as a model for Africa is actually examined in a bit more detail. Thank you, Prof. Um, Dr. Pindai Sutole and Bilo, I see you. I will give you time to speak now. I just want to read a few more questions. To the speakers, when I call out the questions, please try to answer all of them when it's your turn to speak. The first one is to Prof Pra. 
how do we create a cultural system that encourages homegrown solutions to our own problems and also put Africans on the driving seat in creating the Africa we want? And that is from Ronald Zendia. From Conrad Nyati, also to Professor Pra, how do we preserve our cultural characteristics and ensure that they do not get subsumed into a new hybrid culture? That is also from Conrad Nyati. To Amanda from Ronald Zwendia, um, now that business and economy is becoming digital, how do we incorporate heritage and culture into this new digital economy? So I'll leave you with those three. Uh, Dr. Pindai Sitole, you can speak. Yes, we hear you, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much um, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak. And um, I would like to really thank the, the speakers that have presented uh, on this um, agenda of Africanness. Thank you all. I've got um, uh, three questions. One to Amanda. Um, the, the, the motivation uh, that I've seen uh, as you are speaking and the examples you have given us uh, on uh, the youths that are coming up to embrace Africanness in various ways, in entrepreneurship, in leadership, and so on. That has been quite um, uh, encouraging and, um, you know, uh, it, it is really, you know, it provides optimism that we can, um, you know, uh, transform this continent. So my question is, what would you, you I'm coming from a, a, an education background, what would you recommend that our education system in Africa should focus on so that we can um, inspire or encourage the young people, right from the, the, the lower level of education system up to university level, so that by the time they get through these uh, levels of education, they already uh, have the Africanness ingrained in them. So, what would you suggest the education systems or the ministers of education in Africa should do? That's to Thanks. Amanda. The second, <laughs> the second one is on. Um, to Professor uh, Adbajo and Professor um, uh, Pra. In, I'm seeing that uh, from th this discussion you have presented, that we, 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 we talk of Af the richness of African culture in its diversity. But most people, apart from what you have written and a few other Africans who have written about um, our culture, there is a lot that has not been written, and I'm thinking that uh, perhaps Africans we do not have um, a culture of writing, or we whether we don't have a culture I don't know how to describe it, but we the motivation to write about ourselves in a positive way seems to me that it is a missing link. So what should we do so that um, we we actually write positively? about who we are. Then lastly, to um, Madam uh, Jaifa, yes, silence the guns in 2020. I wanted to check with you, you said that you know, the frameworks are in place. Do we also have a framework, a practical framework for monitoring every state in Africa when achieving this agenda of silencing guns? Thank you, Pindai. Um, Bilo, you can raise your question and then we'll take the answers. I'll just ask that Professor Pra, Amanda, uh, Jennifer, and Prof Adebayo, when you answer, address all the questions that were given to you. Bilo, you can oh, go thank ahead. Thank you so much, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I just want to say, I share the same sentiment of thanks as my colleague, Dr. Tole. Um, the contributions which have been made by all the panelists have really been informative and thought provoking. So my question is to Professor um, Adebonje, and it, it has to do with the suggestion that you made about us as African um, heads of states really making our own Berlin, you know, the effects that really the curse of 
the initial Berlin conference did to us. And I think my question has to do with, um, in your in your perspective, if we were to have this kind of conference, how then would we ensure that um, external geopolitical influences, more specifically um, um, Eurocentric influences, do not really hinder the progress that we do try and make in the plans that it has to ask. Do you also not think that maybe the um, African free trade agreement is also a first step to us kind of having this kind of conference where we're trying to really look inward to see how it is that we can best position ourselves better um, as global, you know, players. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll ask that you address all the questions that have been directed to you. Um, Jennifer, you seem ready to go, so you can start. Okay, the, the question on um, what is in place to deal with the um, issues of peace and security and silencing the guns. Well, the African Union uh, Commission has the Peace and Security Architecture, APSA, African Peace and Security Architecture, under which there are a number of pillars that um, meant to address the issues and uh, track and deal with the um, conflict situations in all countries um, where there, there's need. There's the, the pillar of the Peace and Security Council. This is the policy uh, framework that uh, deliberates and makes decisions on, on these issues. We have a continental early warning system that is operated um, in the uh, African Union Commission. There is a peace fund and an African standby force. So all these are the mechanisms that um, have been put in place to, to try and um, deal with the conflict situations on the continent. Of course, there are still trouble spots, um, but with uh, these mechanisms in place, we are hopeful that um, given time, the, the African Union will be able to have successes in this uh, area. Um, I don't think there was another question for me. I just recall that one. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Prof Adebayo? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think Africans do right, uh, contrary to what uh, the questioner was saying, but obviously there are obstacles to research productivity in many parts of Africa that need to be resolved and the conditions need to be improved in order for them to be able to be more productive. And we've talked about some of those issues. But I think it's important to go back also historically because the first generations of Africans came up with the Ibadan School of History and the Dakar School of Culture and the Dar es Salaam School of Political Economy. And these were people that were writing the history of Africa in contrast and in direct opposition to many of the stereotypes and false histories that had been put out by Europeans. And we just recently published a book on curriculum transformation in South Africa, Africa and African American studies, which covered some of these issues. In terms of the Berlin Conference in Africa, I mean, it's kind of like a metaphorical call, you know, there may not be an actual conference. But what I'm trying to implore us to do is to start thinking of ways of promoting regional integration in ways that are more genuine. You know, Africa has the lowest amount of trade amongst ourselves at about 17%. I think Southeast Asia is around 50%. The European Union probably closer to 70%. And what the Europeans were able to do after centuries of wars is to make these borders irrelevant so that a Luxembourg and a Germany can coexist and profitably trade with each other. So that's the kind of thing we need to do. And I believe that's also linked to the African continental free trade area. I'm not a big fan of it because I think the design is flawed. I think if you want to build a free trade area, it needs to be built on the sub-regional institutions as the pillars. And that's what we decided with the Abuja Treaty and others. Otherwise, you're building on sand. If 
Nigeria accounts for 65% of West Africa's economy and South Africa for 60% of Southern Africa's economy. They need to have a vision for regional integration and act as the effective motos and locomotives for promoting this integration. So I think until we actually try to promote genuine integration and also in order for integration to happen, there needs to be something to integrate. At the moment, we're not trading enough things. You know, our goods are too competitive with each other. We're getting stuff out of the ground and exporting it without adding value to it. So those are the sorts of things we need to do, not just the big bank declaring a continental free trade area. You have to do the work at the national and sub-regional level first. Thank you, Prof. Um, Amanda, you can answer straight. Sure. There was a question first about what um, young people are risking the most. And I think I only have one thing to say to that is that the biggest risk is really not taking a risk. And if you're not willing to take a risk to change or change what we think needs to be changed, then nothing will be changed in that sense. Um, so in terms of, there was a question in terms of how to digitize um, the African heritage or how to make it more accessible on a digital scale, knowing that business and economy is really digitizing or rather the future in itself is pretty digital. And I think that it is already, it's already been done in, in a sense that it, there's a process of that happening in each and every industry. There's um, an entre young entrepreneur who recently launched his own um, smartphone and he, he was doing it with a, with a Chinese manufacturer. And for him to almost digitize it, he really changed his whole strategy by making the phone look African firstly, and also producing it in Africa. And then I think that is in the, in the thing of wanting to digitize the African heritage in itself. But, but I think it's been done in music when, when, when young um, African musicians are not singing in English anymore, but they're singing in their own languages. And I think the more we, embrace our languages the more we'd be able to to take and embrace that heritage as well so i, I do agree with um, professor pra that it has a lot to do with the languages and if we conserve the our languages and try and and do a lot of things in our languages we would be able to embrace that heritage even in business and even as we go forward in in digital um in the digital future which we are in right now but the last question which i'd want to ask answer is how the educational system would be able to almost infiltrate the African heritage um, with young, young children. But I think the most easiest way to teach people or to teach young kids specifically is through experience. And if we're not exposing them to an African experience, it would be impossible for them to learn it just on books because the, the thing you learn on a book when you're 12 years old, when you're probably 21, you have forgotten half of it, but you would not forget an unforgettable experience that you had when it, if it's got heritage engraved in it. So we had, we, we launched a, a school heritage experience that we, that we're doing with specific school. And we did with one school specifically in Johannesburg that we took a class of, of, 40 children to have a cultural and traditional experience for them to learn this heritage as opposed to just reading about it. And I was surprised to see that 50% of the class in itself had never seen a shack before. And that's not necessarily through pictures, but physically had never seen one. And that is the importance of trying to infiltrate experience in education. It's not only about reading a book, but it's about actually experiencing this tradition, experiencing the culture. The more you do that, is the more you will try and infiltrate them to, to the point when, when they're older, it would be unforgettable. It's not something they would easily forget because it's not something they just read, but it's something that they experience and it's engraved in who they are as well. Thank you, Professor Pra. Yes, um, the, the question of cultural hybridity and how to preserve our cultural characteristics is a very common issue which people, people wrestle with all the time. Now, please remember that there is no group of people on earth whose culture 
has remained the same from Adam and Eve. All cultures are to a large extent open systems. Cultures are penetrated by other cultures. Cultures absorb influences from others. That happens continuously all the time. What is important for us to remember, however, is that if you don't have a strong basis, if it is not empowered, if your culture is not empowered, then the trading is in such direction that you always lose ground, that you always give way, that your culture is penetrated and always absorbs other influences without it being able to protect itself. Now, what we know also for sure by all linguists and social linguists is that a culture which is not a written culture, which has no written culture, has no way of surviving. A culture which depends only on orality has no basis for preservation. Thirdly, a culture which is not based on indigenous usage of the language also is a leaking culture. So it all boils down to one, using our languages, two, rendering all our languages literate. And please don't believe that there are a thousand 2,500 languages in Africa, because that's not correct. If you count in the Bele, South Africa, as a separate language from the Bele in Zimbabwe, and as separate languages from Siswati in Swaziland, and different languages from Isizulu in South Africa, and a different language from Isikosa in South Africa, then you will count a million and one languages in Africa. But if you have the sense to count them as one core language with varieties, if you use the same orthography, the same spelling system for them, you can write them in such a way that a Zulu will be able to read what a Kosa writes and and the bearer would be able to read the same thing and so on. So quite suddenly you would have languages which for first language speakers, second language speakers, third language speakers would number about 50 to 70 million in each instance. Now the other thing to remember is that all these languages in Africa cross borders. Only a few languages in Africa, a small minority, very small minority, do not cross borders because these borders were created for us not more than a hundred years ago. If we want to make progress, we have to cooperate across borders. This is the meat of the process of African unity, that we should be able to produce books which are for 50, 60, 70 million people on the economies of scale, they are viable. They can be used in schools in all countries in the region because if, you, for example, within Guni languages, if we, use, if we use common orthographies, then we will be able to reach audiences in seven countries in the region. With the Sututuana, it's the same. You know, you're talking about Namibia, uh, Zambia, uh, South Africa, Lesotho, Botswana, and a small section of Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So this is how, and the unity that we're talking about, the African Union, then begins to take a cultural form, which rests on our history, and our cultures, and our customs, and our traditions, and it gives, it immediately expels this feeling of victimhood and powerlessness and inferiority complex. If we can study science and technology in our languages, 
people will not feel inferior. Now, hybridity, don't worry about hybridity because every society, did you see, the Chinese received Buddhism from the Indian subcontinent. They in turn passed Buddhism on to the Koreans. The Koreans passed Buddhism in the fifth century AD on to Japan. The Japanese who learned Buddhism from Korea came back in the 20th century to conquer Korea. They dominated Korea from 1910 to 1945. Korea went and forced their language on Koreans. So, so the, what I'm trying to point out is mixing of cultures, interaction, but it must be on the basis of our own. The foundations should be on our own and they should be strong foundation. Then we can absorb elements that we like. We can be selective and build on what we have with confidence. That is the issue of hybridity. The other is the issue of how to create a cultural system which is robust. Again, I'll go to language. If you write in English, if you write a novel in English, whether you like it or not, whether your face is black or blue or green or yellow, that book becomes part of a culture of the English speaking people of the world. In the first instance, if you write a book in French, like Césaire, like Diop, Pirago Diop, like Senghor, and so it becomes part of French culture in the first instance. It becomes interesting to look at it as an African who had written in French but actually you were contributing to the development of French culture until such time that we start writing these books, like Ngugi Wathiongu has been doing with Gikuyu. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> Our culture is not being developed. The last thing is the thing of culture of writing. I have always argued that it is interesting to note that the so-called French-speaking Africans are more prolific in writing about themselves and their societies, and so, even in French, than the English speakers. I think you could say similar things about the, the Lusophone, so the so-called Lusophone area of the world. But we will not come onto our own until we start writing in our own languages. Then the genius of Africans will show. Then the beauty of our languages, the beauty of our idiom, the beauty of our tongues will come out. Then we will become what we should be. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pra. I think we will wrap up now. Um, there's just two questions that I'll take from the chat. And Harat, I see your hand. I will acknowledge you shortly. The first question, which I think is quite interesting, is how do we detribalize our consciousness and promote the idea of a nation beyond you... one's tribe? This is from Mwai Lusaka. How do we decolonize our consciousness and promote the idea of Africa and the nation beyond one's tribe? The second one uh, for the professors, why can't we as Africans rely on our innate talents instead of looking for a lot of university degrees that have no impact actually? That is from John Shongaye. Why can't we as Africans use our talents instead of looking for a lot of university degrees that have no impact. Um, Kharat, um, we, you, we can take your question. If you are still there, you can speak. 
Can you can you hear me? Yes. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm part of the African Youth Network Movement, the steering committee. What role do uh, you see the African diaspora playing in the development of or the realization of Africa's uh, agenda for um, the Africa that, that we want? Different African diaspora, like the Caribbean, the US, um, they're facing some of the same challenges. So what role do you see uh, them playing um, and African diaspora across the world in uh, Africa's development? Okay, let's answer those and then we'll wrap it up. So any takers? I'll, I'll start that. Now, yes. I think, uh, this, this is a very, this last question is very important question because we have hardly touched on the, the relationship with the diaspora. The diaspora is very important. It's extremely important. It's an organic part of the African being historically. The, in fact, if you look at it uh, historically, the, the, the diaspora has been key to the development of uh, the anti-colonial reaction which emerged in Africa from the beginning, or from the earliest times. Um, I think also that the African diaspora, like all the other diasporas in the world, eventually will have, by all means, an increasing say in what happens on this continent, just like the Chinese diaspora did for China, just like the Indian diaspora is doing <clears throat> for India, just like the Arab diaspora is doing for the Arab world. So the African diaspora has inevitably an important contribution to make, but we also, in turn, have to minister to their needs, also have to listen to them. And I think the key thing that has to happen is that, is that the Africa, we have to recognize that the diaspora left Africa forcibly. They didn't leave with passports. They were taken away forcibly out of this continent. So their right of return, the rights of those that want, in principle, the right of return should be unconditional, you know, and it should be open to them, you know, those that want to take it, but I suspect that looking at the world as it is, there are more Africans who want to go there, than those there who want to come here, this way, this direction. But it doesn't matter, it still doesn't damage the principle that they have a, an unconditional right of return under any terms that we can think of. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pra. Uh, Prof Adibayo? Thank you. Um, just two quick responses. Um, first, on the innate talent instead of university education, I think you need both. Maybe you don't need to collect a lot of degrees. But I think what university training gives you is a certain discipline in how to use that innate talent. And it's no coincidence that many of our, you know, best first generation um, leaders, your Mandelas, your Nkrumas, your Azikiwe, your Inureres, had very solid university education. So I would not underestimate that. And then in terms of this issue of the diaspora, I also think like Professor Pry, it's a really important issue. The African Union has said that the diaspora is the sixth African sub-region, but this is largely devoid of any substance whatsoever. From time to time, maybe they have diaspora meetings where they bring people from the diaspora, but there is no sustained kind of link between the diaspora and Africa. So I believe we need to go back to where Pan-Africanism started, which is a bottom-up civil society movement. We need to move away from a Pan-Africanism 
of governments, which is what happened when Pan-Africanism came home after the fifth Pan-African conference in 1945. So that's what I would encourage more, African-Americans, Caribbeans and Africans actually trying to develop these links and doing things together, whether it's research or what, whatever else they want to do together in terms of lobbying for the promotion of African liberation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will end it there. Um, some of your questions are similar to the ones that have been answered, but the conversation definitely doesn't end here. We will have many more of this. But before we close, I'd like to call upon Mama Grasa Michelle to conclude this session for us and also let us know how MINDS is planning for more events like this. We are very encouraged by your participation and your engagement and we promise to continue to do more. So Mama Grasa Michelle, please could you conclude for us and close the session. This was a very fascinating uh, conversation, I'll call it. We listened from the brilliant minds of uh, some of our leaders of thought. We listened from young generations like Amanda, and of course the interaction from the questions which came uh, made this uh, conversation really very rich. We listened from Jennifer, who is bringing the African Union uh, in its uh, aspirations for Africans, etc. But I would say it was a very good start to systematically bring together people who are interested in really knowing much more in depth what we mean by Africanness, one, but those also who can contribute to help us to unpack, as it happened this afternoon, to unpack what we mean and how we can get there. I, I take from these discussions one some very important uh, contributions which we are going to follow up. The first one is uh, the issue of languages and uh, languages as uh, custodians of our beliefs, our values, our some of the rituals, if you like. But it, all this you can find not only in what we practice in daily basis, but it is expressed in our languages. And I think it's uh, a very valid point when Prof. Pra says, until we are able to learn and to value our languages in a way they become written, they enter into the 10th to 1st century um, part of knowledge, it's, it's going to be very difficult for them, for us to say we can stand on them to dream and to design the future of our development on the continent. So I think we will take as minds the responsibility of following up with the issue of languages. And I'll end up at the end. At the end, I'll say what I think. I take also a very strong point of, uh, from this that we need to research, we need to document. And Amanda was very strong on this to say young people, they, do know very, they know very little of African heritage. So it's not their fault. It's because either those who are old enough or those who are in uh, research institutions do not bring it to the, to the light in a way young people can be interacting with them to own them. And yes, you made a good point, Amanda, that it's not only about the theory of what African heritage is, but you need to practice. 
And that's the responsibilities which are not only of public space, but they have to be also our families, our communities to do that. In fact, I must say that sometimes we just have, do not have the link or the linkage between what happens in our communities and what is in public space. Because if you look at the way our marriages, our funerals, uh, when we celebrate our child is born, etc. Yes, we do go back to our heritage. But it's like this is a private issue. It's not brought to the public space. And I think we need to find ways of uh, really uh, popularizing those community and family practices which define us to become and to belong to our public space. But here I take the note that young people cannot love what they do not know. So we do intentionally really encourage one, research and documentation what, of what African heritage is all about. Second, write about it, then we will have what I will call intergenerational dialogue. As we had this afternoon, you have those who have been socialized, perhaps in the traditional, already in a space professional dialogues are very important. And we will, uh, as we tried with this webinar, actually, we, we brought all the genera young generation, and we'll continue to, to, to follow that, that approach. And I was also very uh, happy to hear about the uh, Laduma story. I've seen it, but it, it was uh, interesting to revisit it. And to say, you know, you can only take pride and fight for your culture if you feel it. It's a part of you. And this is probably what we need also to see how we can to make it happen. Because I don't want to be long. I found very interesting the idea which came from Professor Debajo to say we need to oh, undo the curse of uh, Berlin Conference. And I think we'll follow this. It is true, it's a metaphor. But more than metaphor, I think it can be encouraged to happen in different levels, not only of heads of states and uh, uh, governments, but we also as a civil society organizations, we can have a process in which, yes, we accept that we have an important role in undoing the Berlin, the Berlin Conference. And the issue of how we popularize languages, for instance, it's one of them, as Professor Ra was saying, and many other ways we can find. But we will follow this, this line, what it means and what can be done to undo the curse of Berlin Conference. Then the Pan-Africanism. Yes, it is true. And I just want to share very quickly that MINDS is quite aware of the importance of Pan-Africanism. In our own way, we established the program of the scholarship for young Africans who deliberately are not going to do the master's or, uh, I mean, the postgrad, whether it's master's or it's PhD, in their country of origin. They have to go to another African country. They don't go to America or to, uh, uh, to, to Europe or to, to China. They have to do their postgrads in Africa. We did this deliberately, precisely to give them the experience of living and experience another country, other culture, which is part of the African cultures. But when you live one, two, three years in one country, definitely you contribute also to break these borders which were imposed on us. And we also have established the African Youth Network Movement, which exactly is from the experience of one country, we bring them to work as sub-regions, and very soon we will, re we will go back and revisit the launching of this initiative, having then the 
African summit, which will be based and grounded in what we have learned from national to sub-region, then to come to say, what are the aspirations and what young people are offering to uh, redesign and uh, to build a kind of Africa they want. So we are very conscious of this, but, but perhaps we need to improve the, the methodologies of how to do it, but it is exactly part of the core programs of, uh, of MIND, including the regional integration, which was also discussed here very thoroughly. And uh, we will, yes, continue to explore ways of, as it was suggested, you come from the sub-region than to go to the continent. And this is what we have been trying to do so far. But quickly, I want to speak now of follow-up. I think this uh, webinar has given us an agenda, which is much broader than what we could have thought before. To explore the issue of languages, we definitely will need to have a webinar where we are just going to talk of languages and even to show how languages on the continent cover, I mean, the space which we call Africa, the space which is our Africa, but also connecting with the diaspora. Because go to England or go to uh, Ghanaians or Kenyans, yes, they do speak in their own language. They continue, really. They carry Africa with them where they are, although they also absorb the, the cultures of the, the countries where they live. But what I want to say is we will need to paint our continent and see it graphically if we were to take the line which Professor Pry is suggesting, what really we would have to adopt as languages which could bring together, I mean, all Africans and in specific groups, but in which we could then much easier write about them and take them into the 21st century. It's an exercise which is worth doing. And I think also we could uh, discuss the issues of uh, uh, the, the, the regional integration in the context of, uh, yes, the African Trade Agreement. But again, the African Trade Agreement is an economic integration. But here, as civil society organizations, we have the responsibility of bringing what I called at the beginning, the soft side of integration and how as a civil society organizations, we can and we must play a role in integrating our continent and helping to build that grounding space, which is our cultures, our values, our systems, how do we introduce them and to interact and even to be adopted then as public uh, policies? We have experiences in the past where initiatives of civil society organizations ended up influencing policy and the policy was adopted and policy is being implemented. If I can tell you about the, the experience of FAWE and girls' education on the continent, it was driven by women who were ministers of education. Uh, there were also some of them, they were ministers of culture and including, I mean, vice chancellors, etc. They did a thorough work and they forced, if I can say, they forced themselves to influence the policies, which now we take for granted in terms of girls' education and give, uh, providing equal rights to boys and, go, uh, and girls in education. That is an exercise which, in a very determined way, we should bring more and more people to, to join and to work together. So thank you so much for this. We will come back, of course, with our young, brilliant minds like Kera, to say, how do we transform this into a plan of action? I made some comments, but it will be transformed into a plan of action. And we will bring it back the consult with consultations with our very first, I mean, uh, uh, speakers. 
And I have to acknowledge also, I think I heard Pindai speaking here. He is one of the scholars who have been advising minds and he organized for us some of the discussion groups and workshops which we uh, define, we, we, we have taken. So we have already a pool of uh, scholars, a pool of intellectuals who are involved with this issue. All of you will be brought then to help us then to reshape this agenda and in a sequence which makes sense then to become a programmatic way of uh, approaching this very intriguing but very stimulating issue of what do we mean by Africanness. So thank you so, so very much to our speakers. Thank you so, so very much to uh, the organizers, Kara and your team. Thank you so very much to many people who are out there who have participated. Some of them, they had opportunity to ask questions. Others didn't have the chance to ask questions. But please stay tuned, if you, I can say it this way. Come back with us, not only to ask questions, give you input. When you ask, how do we do this? It's because you have already an opinion. So instead of asking the question, please write down and say, I think we should detribalize, for instance, our minds in such a such way. So give us your contribution. Become part of the building of this uh, body of knowledge we're talking about and own this program. It's yours. We are just the facilitators, but please own it. And those who have ideas of how we should uh, bring other uh, themes to be part of the dialogues which we are going to continue to do. Please give us those suggestions and we'll be extremely happy then to take into account your suggestions and your contributions. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you once again. And back to you now, Kera, please. Thank you, ma'am. Obrigada. Um, <laughs> and thank you to all of you for attending. Um, I just want to share regards and greetings from Prof. Beyi Moyo, who is the director for the Center of African Philanthropy and Social Investment at Vets Business School. So he's showing his support. And I just want to emphasize what mom says. Let's own it. This is our program. There's a massive agenda that we still need to achieve in order to undo the wrongs of the Berlin Conference and create the Africa that we want. So this is most certainly not the end. We will have another webinar on the 30th of June. In the spirit of researching and documenting African heritage, we're going to be looking at African science. How is it that we know things, we're able to forecast things, we have indigenous knowledge systems that are not documented. So we're going to dive into that. And we're also going to highlight the contributions to science and technology by African people, because even that is not documented. So please look forward to that. Um, I take note of your comments to accommodate the French speaking people and the Portuguese people. So we will make an effort to make sure that it can be broadcast in different languages as well, as we are very inclusive in our approach. So thank you everybody. I am polishing up Swahili and I want to say goodbye in Swahili, which is kwaheri tunane tena. Goodbye and see you soon.